Hello and welcome to the Rise Up with Orion podcast. Thank you so much for joining us for this monthly webinar. If you joined us last month, you might have noticed and listened that we were talking about grief and how to build resiliency when we're dealing with loss. And this is a very interesting follow-up to that in a different way, kind of turning it inward and outward. And we're going to be talking about empathy versus sympathy. So it's a very interesting follow-up to that one that we had last month. So feel free to listen if you haven't already. And again, you kind of can apply it accordingly. So I'm so excited to welcome who I can truly call my friend, if you are listening to our banter at the beginning. Um, but Heather Devine is one of my now good friends. Um, Heather lives in Jackson, Wyoming. She's still in the snow. She's been there since 2011 and now lives in Victor, Idaho. Heather hails from Richmond, Virginia, where she received her bachelor's of fine arts from VCU, concentrating in animation and media studies. She's worked at a TV station for her alma mater and a creative agency and is now pursuing her own marketing business, Transcend Ideas. She also founded a nonprofit organization, People Spread Love, that engages with community members to write letters to people facing adversity all over the world. In her free time, you'll see her volunteering in the community, enjoying the outdoors with her husband and her son and her crazy mutt, Sadie. So Heather, it is so great to see you again. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for joining our webinar and bringing really so much of your expertise from your nonprofit and really how you live your life with these two words that sound very, very similar to those that don't dig in a little bit deeper. So empathy versus sympathy. Um, can you define these the way that you would define them and help us kind of start to discover the differences between them? That's a really good question. So you know, we could really just Google it, quite frankly, to see what those two mean. Because um, truth be told, before I started work, the work with People Thread Love, I wasn't super familiar with what the difference was. Um, as you probably know, when you go to a grocery store and you pick up cards, it reads, the, the category reads sympathy. But I would, hopefully at the end of this conversation, you realize that it really should be empathy. So let me define empathy. So empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. And the definition of sympathy is feelings of pity and sorrow for someone else's misfortune. So I don't know if you can already pick up the differences yeah. there. Mm -hmm. um, so according to Brene Brown, because I love her dearly, um, and I'm gonna be quoting her maybe a couple of times in this conversation, is empathy drives connection where sympathy drives disconnection. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's a lot of really great, so I'm already gonna mention this um, as one of the things that we, that we may wanna reference. And if you're interested in this kind of definitions and understanding how words work um, when it comes to emotional intelligence, um, I love the book by Brene Brown, Atlas of the Heart, mm -hmm. because she really goes into dissecting all of these words that we use almost interchangeably. Um, with one another, but empathy and sympathy, there's quite a difference between the two of them. Yes, no question. That's so funny that you mentioned that um, because we actually have an Orion book club and that is going to be one of our featured books later in the year. So you're just, you, you are right on the path for our podcast this year. So that is one of the books and I love it as well. I learned so much from that book. Um, but I want to circle back to what you said, Heather, and I think it's so important as you know, there's a connection versus a disconnection. And this is something that unfortunately we learn this really, really early on, um, you know, and uh, you with a son and me with children and all of that. Again, we learn, you know, sympathy and empathy really, really young, but I don't think that difference is really stated. Um, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> because yeah. I mean, it, we can already just do a quick practice, right? You can go to your local news station, check on social media, see what's coming up in your news feed, and see what's happening across the world. And it can be easy to say, okay, I'm glad that's not me. You know, mm -hmm. I'm glad that I'm not going through that right now, which <clears throat> we all have those different waves of emotion that kind of flow through us when we hear something awful. Um, I mean, I just recently heard of something just so incredibly tragic in my hometown and I felt this instant empathy kind of wash over me because um, it involved children 
and it was a fire in a house and it's just so awful. And my first instinct was like, oh my goodness, like that just felt that hit really hard as a mom and like as a person in the community that wants to live there. And so I felt instant empathy. Um, I will say that if, <clears throat> if we don't feel like we have a common thread with the people in, in that particular diversity, we may not feel as much empathy. Um, mm -hmm. And I, like if something happens in a different country, we won't automatically feel like, oh my gosh, I feel this deep empathy for them. It may take a little bit more effort because you can't immediately feel that connection to that person, um, mm -hmm. particularly, especially how it's framed in the news. Um, and so I just want us to be just aware um, what kind of washes over us and realizing that empathy is in fact a muscle we have to flex. It's just like going to the gym, you're flexing any muscle, a bicep, a quad. It takes time. So please don't be hard on yourself. If you don't already Im immediately say, oh, I'm so glad it's not my kids, you know, or so glad mm -hmm. it's not in my town. Um, of course, that sometimes happens too, where you're, that feeling comes up. But just recognizing the difference between what drives connection and what drives disconnection. Um, the last thing we want to do that I'll mention in this conversation further is you know, what the reason why, you know, something like sympathy creates division or disconnection is that we're remote of it, right? We have, we have distanced ourselves away from the feeling of feeling so connected that it feels uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's normal for our survival. We feel like we have to do some kind of self-protecting. Um, and I also will get that, get into that in a minute as well. So because that's important too, to take care of self. Yeah, absolutely. So Heather, we've talked about a little bit of the differences as well. And I think you have kind of nailed it on the head is, you know, for yourself, you're recognizing that you're recognizing the, oh, I feel so sorry for you versus what can I do? You know, how can I, you know, feel and help the other people? So what's kind of that first step in, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, you know, I'm not going to do one bicep curl. It's going to be something that I'm going to do over and over and over again. But really, what's the first step in starting to recognize that and to and to shift emotionally and mentally, you know, from those two different terms that we're talking about? Oh, gosh. Well, a couple of steps that we could take is, um, <clears throat> oh, gosh, there's a lot. <laughs> but what I will say right off the bat is learn how to deeply listen. Um, you can deeply listen with your spouse. It's always nice to start from your intimate partner, although that takes sometimes more practice because depending on how long you've been together, patterns you've created with each other, it does take a while to retrain um, ourselves um, to shift how we show up for each other. But deeply listening to each other in order to, with the goal in order to understand versus, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to wait my turn and then I'm going to speak and I'm going to share about my experience. I think we do that because as humans, we innately want to relate and we want to share. We're storytellers. Um, but at the same time, it's really important to just hold space. It's important to just listen deeply um, and acknowledge whatever feeling that comes up for that person that you're speaking to and giving your undivided attention to. Also, the other thing, put your phone down. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to spend time with this particular person, um, just be, pay attention to attention is probably the most valuable thing that you can share with people these days. I mean, we're zipped to and fro on our phones, on our devices, and it's better to just put it down and pay attention to each other. Eye contact is great. Giving undivided attention, nothing else is going to distract you. I think that if we try to divide our attention too much, it becomes this battle for attention and battle for, for um, the ability to really truly deeply listen. Because if we're too distracted from other outside things, we can't show up. And we, we know um, if you put yourself in the same position where you wanna be deeply listened to and heard, um, like, you know, if you're seeing your spouse just doing one of these, that is probably incredibly triggering for all of us, right? Right. Um, there's nothing like that that just 
creates disconnection. You're like, oh, great. I'm sitting here and talking to no one. Um, you don't, right. you don't have, yeah. you don't have your full attention. So mm-hmm. I think that that's first. Um, so I think even as something as simple as that, Tara, I don't even think we need to like go into so many examples, but I think that if you could really take the time to give someone your undivided attention. The other day I had um, coffee with a girlfriend and the devices were away and I deeply listened to her and my body language says, I want to listen to you. And a lot of the body language is, can be like this if we're feeling closed off. Um, but if you open and you just kind of sit and you keep your body, you know, directing towards them, your eyes towards them. And in some cases, it might be really difficult to hold eye contact or uncomfortable for some people, but just having this openness, I think is really important. Yeah. I mean, you're amazing what your physical presence can do to your mental and emotional state. There is no question. And with that, that openness will bring more empathy. There's no question. Um, something that I wasn't planning on asking you, Heather, but there is, there's also the need, um, to be empathetic with yourself. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's all, it's not always about, you know, dishing it out to other people to feel that connection, but you know, let's talk a little bit about turning it back on ourselves. Yeah, that's a great question. (laughs) It's so important. I know people, you, all the sayings that you hear that sound cliche are cliches for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you can't. You can't um, pour from an empty cup, you know, right. um, is just one example. And you're absolutely right. And probably my, probably the word that I like the best in order to have empathy starting from self is in order to show up for others, you have to show up for yourself first. There's no question about that. Um, another great word for empathy for self is grace. You know, you're running behind or you're feeling scattered you need to recharge, you're, you're feeling a little bit um, discombobulated or you're not feeling totally yourself. It's like those deep breathing. It's like, mm-hmm. just like realizing that like, I can take a second for myself. We're constantly, and I'm, I, I won't speak for everybody, but I think that it can often happen if you're feeling scrambled in self, um, whether you've overloaded your schedule, which I've done often enough, um, if you felt like you are kind of feeling this overextendedness, the best thing that in my mind that you could do to remedy to, to remedy the worry state is to just take a second and say, look, I'm going to give me, give myself some grace today. I might not always be perfectly on time. I might not always be able to, um, feel fully myself, but what I'm going to do is just take a minute to just say, thank you. Like, thanks for for sticking by me, like, thank you. And thanking ourselves. And I know that sounds a little woo-woo, but we are, we need to advocate for ourselves and our own mental health. So it's really important to like, just take a second. Um, I have an app on my phone. I've got quite a few that I use as resources um, and we'll discuss that later. But like just a way to like get back into center, right? Yeah. Whatever that looks like for you, if that's a meditation app or if that's prayer, if that's just simple breathing, yoga, whatever you need to like get back into center and back into peace, um, even if it's just a little bit of peace, you mm-hmm. know, because sometimes there's chaos, right? We've got games to drive to. We've got diagnoses we have to deal with. We've got insurance we have to call. Like, I mean, trust me, um, cars that break down. There's all kinds of things because life continually rolls, right? Whether you want it to stop or not, the best thing to do is just take a second, maybe in your car and just have this very slowing of the breath. You'll notice your heart rate starts kind of going down a little bit and there's calmness. And I feel like if we can at least parse out some calmness in our day, we're going to be showing up so much better for not only ourselves, but then the people around us, our, our spouses, our children, our dogs, mm-hmm. our, you know, our colleagues, people in our community that we really care about, um, that are often not centered in our lives necessarily, but they're people that matter. You know, we go into a coffee shop and maybe you snap at somebody that you're like, well, I didn't get my coffee right. It's like, well, that person's just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I want to, I don't want to create this tier of importance of people, but I do want to say that people that you just are acquaintances with or categorizes acquaintances. It's 
still have value in your life, um, mm -hmm. more value than you, you think they do. So if you show up, calm the breath and like have this moment, um, and I'm not talking perfection guys, because I think that that's mm -hmm. the problem no. that I think that we're always running into, um, is I have to be perfect. I have to look poised. I have to have all the answers. And I'm telling you right now, you don't. <laughs> Yes. I mean, thank yeah. goodness that there's so many resources this, these days where we can tap into and find what works for us. Yes. You really just, you hit on what we talked about last month when we were talking about grief and loss and, you know, in the chaos of all of that, the one thing we can all do is breathe, you know, and being empathetic, empathetic with ourselves that we don't need to be perfect and we don't need to heal quickly. Like everything is, is a process. Um, you know, as they always say, you know, pro progress, not perfection. Right. And so again, you know, that breath I think is huge. Um, you know, and that's something that I always want to remember as well, when we're reading media, you know, to be empathetic with ourselves, And that's really, you know, part of that is just taking that pause for a few minutes. Um, so Heather, when we advertise this podcast, you had mentioned that empathy is the best way to step into your life. I want you to dig in a little bit deeper th to that and let us what you mean. Let us know what you mean by that. Oh my goodness. Um, <clears throat> so when we were, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm finishing off a cold here. So I apologize mm -hmm. for the, all the sounds. Um, I think that like, you know, very similar to what I said earlier about, um, you know, taking a moment to check in with self. I think that that's really important. When we say steps into life, it's like, well, like I mentioned before, life keeps rolling, right? Whether we want it to or not. Um, and the best thing that we could do in my mind is to do the check-in. Um, you know, I honestly, I have a few people in my life that I check in with, you know, periodically, whether it be my therapist or my sister, or my mom, people in my life that I feel like I can check in with. I think we need to have our people. Like we need to find our circle of people that we really can feel comforted in to talk about things um and of course appropriately of course we don't want to talk, we don't want to unload on all our friends um or our family members um but i think it's just really important to find your support system how do you step into your life in the most empathetic way really starts from yourself and giving yourself grace you're never gonna you're not gonna be perfect let's just put that out there um but i think that the best thing that you can do is see um, how you can show up for self first. And I just want to say that um, there are so many different things that we could do. There's so many steps we could take, but I think that the first one to reiterate is, um, is taking care and having that, those moments of breath. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, let's see. Um, sorry. I'm like, yeah, the social connection I think is here. huge. Yeah, no, I think the social yeah. connection is huge as well, because at the beginning you had talked about, you know, it's all about listening. And so within the Orion coaching world, we talk about, we talk about it as empathetic listening. Those are my people that are going to empathetically listen to me. And so we can turn the tables around. If that's a one-way road, it's going to be really hard to form that connection. Um, but again, that empathetic listening is huge to, you know, not pass just judgment, just to listen and form that, um, I think is the way, um, in my mind is how that, that social connection is truly formed. Um, oh, totally. you know, empathetic listening is huge, but guess what? They have to listen to you in order for that, yeah. <laughs> in order for that oh, to really you're absolutely and take right. We yeah. can't just be like oh, I'm going to take care of myself or we're not islands, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. we have to take care of ourselves and then have somebody to speak to about these things because mm -hmm. things, hard things happen. Yeah. Um, and in, in very degrees. And so we need to be able to, to lean into each other. Mm -hmm. And Heather, let's talk about a little bit about flexing those muscles. Obviously you have a nonprofit and this is what you do. This is how I know you and why I love you because you do this regularly, um, you know, to spread the love and to express empathy versus, oh, I feel so sorry for you. Um, how do you recommend we practice doing these things? For me, it's just a stop and not, you know, not speak before. <laughs> I've actually collected my thoughts when you read something in the media. 
Um, but I would love to know, since you do this regularly, how do you practice this? Where, where do you start? Cause it's pretty easy to be like, mm, I feel so sorry for Heather. I hope she's okay. Leave you alone. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty easy. No, to absolutely. Do that. It's very easy to do that. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, if you flip on the news or get into social media and you see that feed, you know, you see GoFundMes, people wanting to raise money to help support right. their families, um, meal trains, all kinds of things. Um, I think those are all fabulous. Those are great ways to share empathy with somebody. Um, because, you know, we've all had something that has, mm -hmm. you know, reverted our path from, you um, Oh, I'm just going along with my life and then something can happen. Right. And so the best thing we could do is just say, okay, I'm going to send an empathy with this person. I've been through something similar and identifying in yourself um, and realizing that that person is not alone. And for them to realize that they're not alone in that is so incredibly comforting. So I'm going to put my people spread love hat on. Um, and you know, you can absolutely look us up at uh, peoplespreadlove.com if you're interested to learn about origin stories. Um, but what I will say is what's so cool about the organization and why I still feel so deeply about working in this heart-centered work is that the community responds because and, and shows up because it matters to them. They see the value in it. Um, and what it is, is people spread love encourages community members to sit down and write notes of love to people that are facing adversity. And so what happens there is we call them meet and makes and we sit down um, similar table to a dining room table um, or, you know, any communal space. Um, and you sit and you make notes of love for people. So we collect you know, um, re love requests on our website. So you could go to our website and request love for somebody in your life. Could be even yourself. People have requested love for mm -hmm. themselves. No one will be the wiser on how your name showed up on our website. It's completely anonymous. What happens is you write who needs love. You write why they need love and what kind of love would they like to receive today. And so what uh, reasons why we have, how do they want to receive love? I mean, if you guys know anything about the five, five love languages, you realize everybody receives love differently. Some mm -hmm. people love it by um, hugs, like by touch. Some love it by gifts. Some love words of affirmation. Some love acts of service, right? And so, or a combination of that. So it just depends uh, on the person. And it's very interesting to, to learn more about that. Um, and so we also realize that some people are religious and some people are not. Some people are more, you know, consider themselves more spiritual. Some people are just wanting something to cheer them up, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we get people that says, kids love jokes or mm -hmm. this child can't <laughs> read. So just draw pictures, you know? And so like anything to cheer them up because um, we're not necessarily, and yes, empathy is, the dominant force here, right, is that we're sitting, we're reading about the people who need love, and we're holding space of empathy. We're feeling, we're feeling, oh my goodness, they're going through something. I'm not pitying them. I'm not like, oh, thank God it's not me, you know, um, and maybe you'll get waves of that coming through. But what I'll tell you is when we decide to show empathy and to show up, what we're doing is using the greatest tool of compassion. And this is why I, I'd love to read from Brene Brown's book, if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. Sarah. And it's just a way to, um, you know, again, hit home what these definitions mean. Um, and so this is a quote, she's quoted someone else. So this is why I don't want to, and she quoted in bringing home the Dharma from Jack Cornfield. And it says, pity sees them as different from ourselves. It creates separation between ourselves and others, a sense of distance and remoteness from the suffering of others that is affirming and gratifying self. Compassion is shared suffering. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to go back into quoting um, Brene. Empathy is a tool of compassion. We can respond empathetically 
only if we're willing to be present to someone else's pain. If we're not willing to do that, it's not real empathy. So I'm saying in sharing these words is more of like framing us and getting us ready for this practice because, you know, we can sit and this is often what happens here. And I'm sure you realize the same too. If you're holding what we call meet and makes for people's spread love, if you're not feeling an empathetic state, you know, and you're not feeling like you have the words mm -hmm. right now, you can sit in color in a communal space, right? You can color, you can draw, you can just be together with your friends. And then maybe later, because I think that empathy, yes, it can be done as, as a space for community when we're sitting together, but sometimes it's very often just deep flexing, mm -hmm. right? Right. We got to flex those muscles and sometimes it takes individual training. that You can yes. only do yourself. Um, so oftentimes I'm finding that people have meet and makes with us and they're like, I really want to finish this at home. I really want to do this justice. And what they'll do is they'll yeah. take it home and then they'll give it to me later or they'll mail it or whatever. Right. Um, and it's just this way of like, a, you know, that care of kindness, that compassion that comes right through that work is so amazing. And it comes through in all of these letters. So um, yeah, what I've noticed, second. yeah, I've noticed that sometimes as well through, you know, those acts, as you're saying, you know, through the meet and makes and trying to share that with others is a lot of people, it's uncomfortable um, to feel that and to internalize that. I mean, I, I held one where we were writing to a child, you know, and even just trying to put jokes on paper when you're feeling so deeply that what they're feeling to try to come up with a joke that would just try to cheer them up was nearly impossible because it is uncomfortable and it is, you know, you're really stretching those heart muscles, um, you know, and sometimes putting something into words, that is the hardest part. I can draw and I can color and I can paint all day long, but the moment you say, Tara put something into words, um, it's a struggle. Um, and again, you know, that's why it's okay to continue to flex these because you will get better, I think. Um, you know, I know I have over time, but again, there's still moments where it just throws me on my heels, you know, because of that compassion. Um, and I love what you said, Heather, the other word that is a really a contrast that we're talking about today is the word of pity. Um, for some reason that just kind of has an edge to it, doesn't it? It doesn't feel very good when you pity someone else or you pity their situation. Um, that has an edge to it as well. So I kind of want to stomp that one down and, you know, challenge people you know, to, to stop that one out of their life, if at all possible. Absolutely. No one wants to feel pity from someone else. Mm -mm. No, or do, I don't good. want people to pity me either. How horrible. But no, yeah, I mean, no. I, I love that contrast because it really, it's, you know, the good and the bad, the yin and the yang, you know, it's a great contrast word that I think is very important to, I'm glad you stated that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Brene does the work. I mean, she's been doing tons of research. I've got another book that I'd love to bring up as well, um, if that's okay. It's actually called The Compassionate Instinct. It's um, a book compiled by the science of human goodness. Um, it is a beautiful book. Um, and it's something that I have in my library that I just love. Um, and it mentions that Empathy is a skill, it's a fundamental building block of our individual happiness and well being, as well as a peaceful society. So, I think that if we can master empathy, mm -hmm. I think we're all going to see a lot more of a compassionate, loving world, you know, yes. one that we feel proud to live inside. Um, I think that, and I'm going to rant till the cows come home, is that the more we're connected with technology, I feel like there is connection, but there's also disconnection happening because we have so much information that we're trying to contain that it becomes mm -hmm. so overwhelming that we start losing compassion for other people. We start losing real skillful, helpful tools like empathy, um, you know, and we kind of get lost in that soup of too much information. Um, and, I just don't, I don't, I don't want society to go that way. I don't think yeah. that it's healthy and I don't think it's useful um, because let's just face it. If you're looking something on looking at something 
um, through your social feed or, you know, however you feed information into yourself. And maybe you've completely unsubscribed and hallelujah. I wish I could 100% right. do that. Um, the goal is, is to take an information and not to sit with every single thing that happens. It's awful because mm -hmm. yes, quite frankly, too much. that's, that can paralyze you um, no. and it can make you not move and leave the house. Um, it can make you feel fear of the world. That's not what we want. But what we want to do is to be able to show up in your life, let yourself um, fuel, be fueled by your strength of empathy mm -hmm. and the, your ability to show up for the people in your life that you care about and the things you care about. So maybe you love horses. Maybe you, mm -hmm. all you want to do is be on a ranch and work with horses. Like if you're not able to like show up for yourself, that horse is going to feel that energy. Like I'm just putting an example out yeah. there. Um, there's just so much that we, we have all this inner work to do as adults um, that we, you know, this empathy muscle and flexing, like flexing that, which I said earlier is incredibly important. Um, can I, if, if that's okay with you, Tara, I'd love to mention applying, like we're talking about writing notes of love, but then there's another tool um, that I have come up with in the classroom that could be really helpful for adults um, and for older, because I work with children of all ages um, and we do empathy programming and we talk about, um, you know, really defining these words, but then also asking the classroom to share, okay, well, what would you say to somebody going through something? And these children know what to say like it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be perfect and I think because to your point to your point Tara about like trying to find the right words that's the thing with adults is yes. that we show up to an art class or we show up for a, a meet and make and we're like oh I'm not creative enough or I don't have the right words or I'm not perfect and it's like leave that behind y'all like just leave that behind <laughs> please dear god yeah. um leave that behind i mean if you want a draft of something and you want to just like draft it up and write all scribbly then by all means like draft make as many mm -hmm. drafts as you want but know that it's not about perfection it's about practice it's about putting into practice so we have a more compassionate loving world um and so what i do with children of all ages and this one in particular is for older children in high school and what we do, middle school, high school, and what we do is have these um, categories on the chalkboard um, on different sides of the classroom. It says empathy and sympathy. And what we do is we categorize these different things that we could say to each other. Um, like in asking ourselves in groups, does this statement drive connection or does it drive disconnection? Yes. Oh, you do know? you have some examples? I do. I do. Yes. Um, Yes. And I think that like, it might be a good practice. Now we can make them a little bit more complex um, if you'd like, but um, oh, here, you want to hear one? Yes. So one of yeah. Them, to all of our listeners, them, put it in two categories. Yes. Love it. Yeah. And one of them says, I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. At least you have your health. Hmm. Right. Yep. Um, I'm sorry about your divorce, but at least you were married at least are you're you're creating the great divide here aren't you i'm sorry this happened to you life just isn't fair sometimes if you think that's unfair listen to what happened to me oh oh okay love right? it yeah yeah and it's just um, something so simple and to me there's almost one or two words just in those statements that that's the rub it's not the whole thing but there's one or two words that create that divide yeah yeah, it feels like a dig. It feels like, oh, wow, you changed that vibe really fast. Mm -hmm. um, right. I'm so yeah. sorry you're sad. Please know I'm here to listen and be with you. Oh, that feels yes. so much better. Yep. <laughs> you it feel does. that immediate like vibe mm -hmm. change, right? It feels a lot more connected and a lot less. I'm going to remove myself from this discomfort or I'm going to, I'm going to make it better for you. And I think that that's the part that I also want to reiterate in this conversation is that it's not about fixing the problem and maybe there's no problem to fix, you know, maybe it's just in order to just show up for each other. And I think that that's the misconception a lot of this work does, um, how we show up for each other, how we show up for our children, something bad happens. Flying off the handle is probably our first instinct. Why did you do this? 
just laugh. Mm -hmm. Um, but the second one would be, okay, like what's happening? Like, let's, Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let me listen to you. First of all, let's not talk too much. Right. Is our judgment will come up. It's just a normal human instinct. Like that's what we do, right? Um, yeah. We're not meant to, again, not seeking perfection here, but we are seeking to improve how we show up. Yes. Well, and you're seeking to understand, you know, because so much it's, it's a misunderstanding that, you know, our emotions go completely out of control. So the yes. importance of the pause, the importance of the listen. <laughs> yep. Yes. And can I just mention something else? Um, you, you helped me, you know, we were talking earlier about how to show up and step into your life. We mm-hmm. talked about finding your people. Um, I have a friend um, and I always tell her, I'm here for you, I'm here for you. And she knows I'm here for her. But based on what she was facing, I couldn't possibly show up as empathetic because I haven't been through the same thing, right? And so because of that, she knew she had to do some self-protecting. Yep. Not because of me specifically, but more for her and her mental health, right? And for her to feel like I feel supported with these people that have been through something similar to me. And, um, you know, it, and it can really mean anything. It could be grieving. It could be about, um, you know, fertility journeys, you know, so it's really anything. Um, and so in saying that, we just have to, when we, when we show up for somebody in our lives and we know we're going through something, maybe you're not the person they need to talk to you right now. And that's okay. It's not personal at all. Um, and so just being aware of that. And if the same thing happens where you're on the other end and maybe can't talk to them or don't feel as comfortable talking to them, that's mm-hmm. also okay too. It doesn't mean that they're less a friend or less a connected um, person in your life. It just means that there's a shift that needs to happen and you just need to be aware of that and kind of gauge that out. Yes. Well, and allowing the space for them to, to heal in what they will come back around. Um, but again, allowing them that, and it circles back to what we talked about last, last month as well is, you know, with loss, you know, the, our therapist's wife, um, she just wanted him to stop talking, (laughs) you know, stop being my husband therapist. Just give me a hug. You know, I want nothing to be said, you know, just hug me, you know? And again, it took him a little while to figure that out because she had to express that to him. But again, all she wanted was a hug. Don't say anything. Oh, I love hugs. But again, you know I love hugs. Yes, I, I my know. favorite. Yes, it goes back to that love language as well. And I think so much of that is, you know, we're talking about empathetic listening, but at the same time, communication is key to that as well. He never would have known that all she wanted was a hug and to not have him say anything until she told him that. (laughs) So, you know, there's those crucial discussions that have to happen, but if they're fueled by empathy, I think those discussions are so beneficial, just like the listening that we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that part of that emotional intelligence that um, many of us forget, or maybe not even have very much emotional intelligence, because it does Mm -hmm. take practice uh, is um, realizing that, you know, if you're having a difficult time communicating with someone, it could be because maybe you're making it about you, you know, in that particular instance. Like, so for example, if you're like, well, why doesn't he want to talk to me? You know, just giving an example here, nothing from real life. No, no never, <laughs> never, ever, uh, obviously. Um, but you're like, why doesn't he want to talk to me? Like, or why does, why do I keep getting these like passing vibes? Like there's something wrong. Oh, I did something. Oh, it's about me, me, me. And instead, maybe we need to just take a breath, slow down, and not pass judgment immediately and just use what's in your tool belt, take a breath, and like just not even not even make it about you. Because I think it's easy to do that. Um, even really empathetic people, and I feel like I am empathetic to a degree. I still think that I have a lot of work to do. Um, even though I talk about this stuff with you, I don't and I practice this. I still have work to do Mm because we're all human beings, you know, Mm -hmm. um, no one's, no one's an absolute pro at all the things. Um, but I think of trying to apply it and being aware that, Hey, it's not, maybe it's not about you today. Maybe, you know, something happened, um, it really affected them and they're not in a place to really express how they're feeling right now. Um, and I think that we need to just do that check-in with ourselves. Um, yep. 
Yeah. That's a regular discussion here with children as well, because, you know, as much as we would like them not to be, every child is very self-centered, um, you know, and they are always fearful that their friends are mad at them, that their friends don't like them. But the reality is, is everyone focuses on themselves, you know? So if they don't like your shoes, probably isn't that they don't like you, you know, they may just be having a bad day and they didn't like what was packed for lunch. So again, we have that discussion a lot that, you know, we're all pretty self-centered. So we need to open that up a little bit and it, it maybe isn't about us. And I love that. Yeah. And I love Tara really quick. You mentioned food because yeah. like, let's just be honest. Most people can't show up clearly if they don't have food in their belly, mm-hmm. they can't show up at all in an efficient way without food. So, um, and children can't learn without it. Um, and so it's just really important to make sure your basic needs are met, um, because it sure makes it difficult to have a constructive conversation with anybody, um, yep. if your needs aren't met. And we all have bad days. We all have, you know, hormonal fluctuations. We all have bad nights sleep, you know, there's things. So giving yourself grace, you know, going back to what you talked about at the beginning, I love that word as well. Um, so totally. Heather, you talked about a couple resources. I would love for you to repeat them if you will. And I will be adding yeah. them to the show notes. Um, so books like The Compassionate Instinct that I scribbled down. What are the other resources that you love that other people can reach out for for more information? Yeah, um, you want to hear something cool? We put together, for People Spread Love, put together a book, a recommended books for heart work. It's on our blog on peoplespreadlove.com. So there's a ton more. But one of the other ones is actually written by my friend who suffered through a stillbirth. It's called Still His Mama. And this touches on grief. Um, It is not only a testimony of her own, but it's, um, it pulls different stories in. And what's really beautiful about this book is that it also is a workbook. So it helps go through grief process. It goes through, you know, different, and she actually creates mock letters between two Mm -hmm. women that have faced similar experiences with stillbirth. And it was just a way of like, again, showing up for each other with empathy um, because they faced a similar thing. And so I just, I love it. And it just, yeah, it touches my heart um, pretty deeply listening to, or in this case, reading um, her book, um, which I love. And then, um, Atlas of the Heart, which I brought up from Brene Brown that I have in front of me. Um, And then I love apps, um, meditation apps um, in particular. There's actually one called Mama Zen app. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's very specific to women. Um, I think it's going to be, it would be beneficial for papas too, to be totally frank. But um, it's really about recentering. And I really like it. And it's been really useful for me. It's a great way to show up for your kids. You know, if you're going through some anger things, you're not able to, you know, and there's even, I even listened to it this morning. There's a compassionate and empathy practice on there, which I loved. Um, They run you through like breathing practices. Um, I love 10% Happier Mm -hmm. in another app, which I love. Um, Headspace is also wonderful. I have so many apps I've tried. Um, And it just helps, you know, it's just recentering, bringing ourselves back to um, you know, perspective. Cause I think that we do get pretty self-centered. You talked about children, which is part of the children's journey and in growing into a world that they're discovering, um, is adults get very self-centered very fast. Um, because we've got our bills, maybe we've got a mortgage, maybe we've got to pay for a car, maybe medical bills start popping up, maybe, 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 right. And jobs being lost, whatever, um, all the things happening. So, how do you, how do you take care of that self? You know, and I think that like, get life gets in the way. And so we need to be able to like, have some perspective here. Um, one of the things I really love too is, um, and I don't have it in front of me, but I love when I look through, um, you know, what is it for affirmations? I think they probably are. You can like flip through. I have a book where you just, you're supposed to just pick it up, whatever page is on there. Um, It helps gain some perspective and it makes you kind of center your day around something to think on for the day or to start your day with the right foot. Um, You know, 
Tara, I'm sure you say this plenty, but having so much sleep is so important. And I've been a big proponent of sleep, um, leaving your device out of your room and like turning off your phone. Um, just don't, don't look at the thing, like drink water, um, go to sleep mm -hmm. at a reasonable time that varies yeah. for everybody. Um, yes. like, you know, not, you know, we've also, me and my husband have also done is any night lights you have in the house, turn them to red light bulbs. Mm. And actually it's because it's less harsh on the eye for circadian rhythm. Cause you want to make sure that you're getting yourself into, into dream state and you're getting yourself ready for bed. Right. Yep. You're like, now it's time to close the lights. Mm -hmm. Um, and even my mom the other day, she said she was stargazing with my nephews and they had, anytime you had your phone, they gave you red cellophane to put over it Yep, because yep. it doesn't interfere. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so stuff like that, there's so many things that we could do to like little hacks, if you will, to like help get ourselves in a state of, I'm going to take care of myself. Um, when we're always looking at our phones and we're always being bombarded with feed, it can be really hard to, um, to show up for ourselves because you're like inundated and it feels overwhelming. Absolutely. Yes, Heather, I'm going to put all of those in there. Um, the author of Steal, Still His Mama, can you tell us who the author of that is? Oh, yes. Um, I'm not great at pronouncing last names and her name, her last name is different, but her first name is Terrell. And I will make sure you get the last name because I don't want to mess up pronunciation. Perfect. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes um, for sure. Um, and again, always want to reiterate, you know, what you spent, you, what you spend so much of your time doing um, is people spread love for those that are interested in that organization. I've been very close to it for many years now. But again, for anyone who's interested in learning more about people spread love or, you know, practicing or, you know, doing this heart work, as Heather said, um, it is a great way to do that. So people spread love, you know, check out all of the social media as well as people spread love.com. Um, you know, it's an amazing organization and Heather is, is the brain and the heart behind it. So Heather, thank you so much for joining us. It is so good to see you in a different realm um, and to bring your empathetic self to our podcast. So I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Tara, for the time. And thank you everyone who joined us. Yes. Thank you so much. And for those of you that are regular podcast listeners, the book club is coming back next month. We're actually going to be talking about a book called The Dream Manager. So all the dreamers out there, please come and check it out. If you haven't read The Dream Manager by Matthew Kelly, check it out. We'll be discussing that with some of our Orion Health Coaches next month. And as Heather already said, I've got the red book behind me. Atlas of the Heart is coming up after that. So we will be discussing that, um, which again, will circle back to so many of the conversations that we've had this, this year within our podcast. So Heather, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining Rise Up with Orion. Thank you.